from Stanford and went on to do his postdoc in Barcelona and uh, is one of the founders of the department here. And today he'll be talking about seafloor, seafloor gas. So it's a piece. Okay, hi. What uh, Michael uh, neglected or forgot is that now I serve as a co uh, appointment of the Department of Marine Geosciences and the new Department of Marine Technologies, which we funded to give us the to, to give us the way to do things that we couldn't do before, and uh, for us should be viewed as a resource for a for a research. Yes, and uh, today I chose to uh, show you. Um, some sort of a summary of work I've been doing over the last uh, few years and the acknowledgments page, I just now realized I didn't re-edit, but really the, the work is uh, mostly uh, collaborative. Some of this work was done by me, some much of the work is based on data that was collected in the different school cruises and other surveys that we did in this department for the last seven years. Um, of course, there is a collaboration with Gidon uh, that uh, did much of the acquisition. There is recently a very fruitful collaboration with Barak Herut and Orit Sivan, Michal Adler, Gilad, uh, sorry, Michal Sela Adler, uh, Gilad Antler. Together we started doing the geochemical component of this uh, survey. Um, towards the end, I will reach uh, some stuff that, uh, that uh, is being done by, uh, I will show a little bit about what Zid is doing, uh, together with Ari and together with O. Uh, but this will be at the end sort of a dessert. But basically, I'm going to focus on continental shelf shallow sediment gas. Many of us are talking about it. Many of us have been talking about it. Unfortunately, some of the people that are most seriously talking about it are not here, but hopefully they will get it uh, from the internet. Uh, and and it's, it, it's, it, took, it took us a while since we started looking into this problem uh, until we started getting into, into some, some uh, new understandings which I'm going to uh, present here. Also, I'm not going to talk about the sources of the gas. Yes? Uh, neither am I, uh, well, I'm not going to talk about the sources of the gas, which are a subject of its own. For me, the gas or organic material you'll see is, is something that I receive, and I, what I'm mostly looking at is how it behaves when it's near the seafloor. Yes, on the continental shelf, and that sort of avoids many of the works that are being done here because they are being done by others, and I have not been, I have not really touched it very much. Of course, I need to acknowledge Paradigm's contribution in giving uh, us, the laboratory, the software with which I'm doing the work, and Shikmona that has been used for most of this work here. Shallow, uh, shallow gas in shallow sediments on continental shelves, and this is from a, a Fleischer et al. 2001, uh, has been summarized also by Best 2006 in an EOS summary. And you can see the locations where shallow, uh, shallow sediments gas was mapped on continental shelf, and I'm sure that this is now now not a complete uh, depiction of the, of the truth. I know of several sites that I know shallow gas and, and, and they're not presented here. So it's a global thing. Continental shelves have shallow gas. Uh, <coughs> where is this gas or what is the main process? Well, there are several ways people are talking about this shallow gas or, or are approaching this cell of gas. There is the, the methanogenesis, uh, methanotrophy uh, curve in which there is a simple reduction, uh, oxidation reduction process. The, the 
the, sulf the sulfate from the sea, uh, which is abundant in the seawater, uh, reduces and the methane is being produced. And so you see the profile of, of sulfite, sulfate going down, the profile of methane, ca methane coming up. And here we see it at centimeter scale uh, from Athens in 1998. But basically, this process of oxidation reduction is happening with respect to the supply of <coughs> oxygen from the seafloor and supply of organic material within the sediments. And there is, it's an ongoing process and, and can be viewed as, a, as an upward going movie. Basically, the seafloor keeps accumulating, organic material accumulates, methano, uh, uh, the, the methane is created, the methane is eaten. And so that's, and I understand nothing about it, but, uh, but that's a basic process people are talking about. And this is what it looks like, like in Orit Sivan's. Uh, a uh, paper and Orit is, is, is actually looking among the rest of, at the question what is happening beneath the methane, uh, the methane generation area. Theoretically, the, the graphs of mountains at all, the methane just continues down infinitely, uh, indefinitely, it just continues. And Orit has been observing that the methane is actually disappearing and something is eating it. And so there is the other processes here on the other side of it, which I even understand less, that are killing it on the other side. Another, another now. Oh, its profile comes from where? Is it from the Mediterranean? What? No, I think this is from, a, from work she did in the ocean. Ocean. This is this is depth of 200 meters. I think okay. it's from the Atlantic Ocean. But this is a conceptual curve. I mean, take off the numbers, put it in a, in millimeters, and you will go to the Kinneret. Okay. Basically, the concept is the concept, and and the way Oryx sees it, the world is built out of a sea floor and half space. Uh, and uh, can you can you deal with this? Uh, now, notice those works do not talk about methane gas. What we see here is the world of dissolved methane. The methane is in the fluid. There is no bubbles. They, don't, they are not taking part in this, in this story at all. But in geophysics, what we see are bubbles. When do we get bubbles? We get bubbles when the saturation of the methane uh, when, when the co uh, concentration of the methane exceeds saturation. And this is from a paper by Weaver et al. from 1998, where they, they measured the concentration of the methane, and in parallel they did uh, geophysical profiles, and they could see that, they, that when the methane exceeds the saturation, that is when we're starting to get acoustic turbidity, they call it, reflectivity, and that is basically due to the production of bubbles, of free gas. So here we're coming out of the, of the solute area and we're going into free gas and that's what we geophysicists look at. There is a whole set of work on that, what goes on the mechanics and, and the behavior of, of the, the free gas. And this is from Good World 2005, where he uh, talks about bubbles that are penny shaped and are breaking their way up uh, uh, a, elastically, a material that to us seems very plastic. And this is, uh, Regina has been talking about it, and Regina is actually working on, on the initiation and the process of initiation, propagation of those bubbles. This is the world of, oh, okay, we got bubbles, we got bubbles in clay, and now the bubbles are coming up, and this is a whole world of papers. <coughs> But when we look at it on a, on a broader scale, there are different ways gas can reside within the sediments. There is the interstitial bubble story. When we get some gas and it lives within the, within the pores, yes, it doesn't affect very much the properties of the material, but it would be seen very much geophysics, geophysically because the average, the bulk properties, will go a little bit towards the gas properties. For example, acoustic velocity or seismic velocity will decrease substantially. 
The second type is reservoir bubbles. Reservoir bubbles <laughs> push out the fluid that resided in the pores and takes, takes its place. And suddenly, instead of fluid of, of water or brine or whatever there was there, now there is gas in between the grains. And that is what we look at when we are looking for reservoir bubbles. And that's what we have, for example, in Tamar, Leviathan. Of course, this is the very desirable situation. The, the in-between those is what real reservoir looks like. There is some in the water. Yes? And the third situation, and that's the situation of the bubble that we just saw, is when the, the gas is actually not just pushing out the water, but it actually pushes away the frame. Yes? And, and that is what we saw before. The bubble that breaks its way actually moves away the sediment. Now, beyond the fact that this is different concentrations or whatever, the difference between this and that is very important because in terms of physical stability of the material, those predict very different, uh, very different scenarios. Here, the frame still supports the sediment. So you can think about it as a building with rooms and, you know, certain, uh, you know, the, the come the, uh, some invaders and invade the rooms. The building stands. The building doesn't really care about it because the building is held by the building. This situation is a different situation in which suddenly we're starting to break the walls and, and, and the people are actually holding the this, this ceiling. Of course, that here, here the pressure of the gas will be hydrostatic pressure, the pressure of the water, because the frame doesn't really see, it doesn't really load the, the pore at all. Here, the bubble must be pressured by the load of sediment above. So here we're getting excess pressure, overpressure of the sediment. The sediment will be weaker. Of course, this is a mechanically very different scenario. Now, so it comes that these two behaviors are characteristic of different grain size. Bigger grain size have larger porosity a natural porosity between them and what you're getting is more of this kind of, of a mechanism the, the, like for example sand or silt and here you see it really in, in cores cores in which there is gas bubbles and you see that silty sands you get bubbling of, 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 the, of, of gas which is shown but it's not really intensive that is more towards this kind of, of model. While in clay, where there is no porosity, when the gas needs to be there, it needs to make way. It needs to make place. And that is what is happening in this model. And those are some, and this is again from BEST 2004. This is a reversible if the pressure goes down? Basically, the bubble, the bubble goes away and, and it's supposed to be closed after it, right? And is it leaving a weakness or not? It's a good question. We don't really have a good answer for that. Uh, but that, that is an issue. This is, this is where, this is where Regina is working. Regina, Budo, there is a whole lot of people. And this is where the oil and gas industry is working. Yes, and in between, and I'll show you that what we have is, is, is a, an in-between situation. Now let's combine everything together. We learned about the, the, the methanogenesis, uh, methanotrophy, and here you see the decline of the sulfate from the sea, from the sea floor and the production of, of methane. And what you're seeing here is, is the uh, an, anaerobic uh, methanotrophic zone or, or a sulfate methane transition zone over here. Here, the, the concentration of methane basically goes down to essentially zero. So the sulfate has to be finished before the methane, the methane can, can come up. When we go further down, we go into the curve. We may have methane that is dissolved, and we will never see it, because it never produced free gas. It's below, below a saturation. But when there is enough methane, 
what will happen is that we will see saturation, we get an oversaturated zone, and here we produce a free gas. Okay? And basically, what holds in this model, what holds the gas bubbles in place here is the fact that when they try to go above this place, they simply dissolve, right, and are eaten. So there is nothing physically that holds the gas in place. It's the, it's the, it's the process of uh, the solution. Now, something that I forgot to say, but it is very important to say, is that all this process is not done only chemically. It's, in fact, completely controlled by a bacteria. The bacteria are doing all those all the work here. They are doing all the reduction, oxidation, the methanogenesis, and the methanotrophy is all done within the bacteria. It's all a biological system that does it, OK? Now, there is an alternative that I found at this paper from 2005 that described a completely different situation. He shows acoustic blanking. And in a minute, we'll see what it means. It shows that the gas is produced and is basically flowing. There is a pressure gradient, of course. When we go between here and there, there is much more pressure here because we are deeper in the water. So the gas here is under pressure. And since, for some reason, and, and Lee doesn't deal with it, for some reason it cannot go up, it goes this way. So that's a mechanism Lee offers, but he doesn't offer why is it not simply going up? But it does show an observation that then escape is concentrated on, in the shallow. Let's go to our area before my time is finished. Shallow gas on the Mediterranean uh, shelf offshore Israel has been known since 1966, and since the worst works of Neve. There is the Masters of Golan, Masters work of Golan 2006, based on the Artificial Island Project, the NIM map, the distribution of shallow gas uh, in central Israel. Just what does it look like? This is a geophysical traverse, yes, the seafloor, single channel, the seafloor. You see the layers of sediments, and in here you see what they call acoustic turbidity, patches of strong reflectivity which many times blank what is under them. This is acoustic blanking, yes? <clears throat> and we look at it uh, in more detail in a minute. A complementary work was published by Uri in 2012. He started doing the first compilation of our data from, uh, from the school cruisers and offered a model in which there is a deep supply of gas and the gas is distributed in the, and, and map the distribution of gas in the Haifa Bay area. And I will focus on this, and I will just take this map patch and try to understand what's the physics of the gas that is staying there, and that's where, where the rest of the fo work is uh, focused. What do we see when we see shallow gas? Well, you see here again a seismic section, yes, and you can see the scale, you can see that it's very strongly exaggerated, this is 800 meters, while this is just a... Well, here I'm showing just something like 25 meters, yes? So it's very strongly exaggerated, very stretched. And all of my sections would look like this, otherwise we see nothing. Yes, and you see the sedimentary layers that we see, and you see here top coca, <coughs> yes? And what you see is that inside those sedimentary layers, suddenly you see a patches of of something. And you can see that it's not a, a, a lithological body because you can see the layers continuing through it. Yes? More difficult, you could, but, but you, you see them. So, there is scattered high amplitude reflectivity and there are bright spots, strong reflex, uh, reflections. You see stretching of reflections. You see this reflection comes in narrow and suddenly widens. Yes? And that is due to the fact that the, that the gas-bearing sediment is, is lower velocity, and so it takes more time for the, for the seismic waves to travel through them. And then maybe even pop marks, but we're not, this is not clear, not sure. Okay? Now, to try and understand what is in here, 
what I did is I did a small, a small trick, a small geophysical trick. I basically took a cloth and washed it. Or well, what I did is I looked at the specular, the coherent uh, element within it, by simply mixing the traces, doing some filter that mixes and cleans the, the, the noise. And what I found is that within this, I found one layer. You see a reflective layer. You see the normal layer, suddenly reflective layer. Then normal layer, reflective layer. Strongly reflective. Another one. Another one. So basically, what we see is that within this, there are several reflective layers. What does it mean? In order to have reflectivity, I need to have contrast. So in each one of those, I have contrast. Meaning, there is gas, there isn't gas. There is gas, there isn't gas. Or differently saying, I have layers that concentrate gas within them. OK, you understand what I'm saying? There are, there are layers, like this one clearly concentrates Gas, this one. Yes, otherwise I wouldn't be having continued reflectivity. I would just have reflectivity on top and that's it. Yeah, and I can see that here it stops. It's not my, that my data stops. Below I can see reflectivity and I can see it very nicely. The layer of the gas bearing, the gas bearing layers stop. In fact, I define here a six meters thick layer of reflectivity of gas bearing sediments, yes? And that is something new because uh, many people have, 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 it's been always a problem what happens down here because the seismic data doesn't really show it very well. Okay, so yes, we are constrained to a six meters layer uh, of sediments. Now, this, this, this model of, of layers that are bearing gas and layers that are, do not bear gas or have less gas is consistent with the composition or, or with the composition as reflected for example in CPT core penetration tests. You can see that there is very soft clay and then there is sandy clay and then there is different dense sandy. Basically there are layers with more <laughs> silt and sand and layers that are more clay. Layers that have place for gas and contain the gas, layers that don't have don't have it and contain very little gas, if at all. Okay? There is one more thing that I found here. When I start looking, I see that below the gas layer, suddenly there is a discontinuity in the seismic section. Now, it took me a while to, to convince myself in that, uh, that it, it's not just an artifact, but it actually is a shift. And I will show you more examples later on. That, uh, that show you that it, it actually exists. And what we're seeing is a shift of about two milliseconds. A shift of about two milliseconds from a layer of six meters comes out that I have 20 to 30% of seismic velocity reduction in the bulk property of this layer. And taking Wilkins and Richardson 1998, which appear to be, and they also go after Anderson and Anton in 1980, which dealt with the acoustic of gas bearing layers. Basically, if I'm going from 1,400 by 20, 30% down to here, I'm somewhere between the 0.01 to 0.1% percent gas, percent volume of the gas. So the content of the gas is very small in the bulk. Of course, in the concentrated layers, there is more than that, but we don't have 20%. We will have very few percents, if at, at the maximum. Now, this is not the whole story. Remember that before I took this and I washed it. Now, what I did is I took the original data and I removed, and I, I, I subtracted this from the original data to see what's left. And what I see here is something different. What I see here is this very scattered field which is not coherent. There is no layering or anything like this. There's many, many diffractions. What do many, many diffractions mean? Diffractions in seismology are simply reflections of points, of points below resolution or at resolution level. So what I see here are many points that are scattered throughout. 
I will say that these are the bubbles that are crossing between the city layers. These are the bubbles that exist in the clay layers, yes, that are crossing in between. So we have layers that, that have more gas and layers in between them that have bubbles and they are crossing in between and, and this way, and this is the, this is, this is Regina's bubble or, Bud or Boudreau's bubbles. Okay, so we have the two types of gas mixed here because we have two types of sediments mixed here. Yes, there are layers of two, of two different sediments mixed here. Okay, and in fact, this brought me to a paper by Jens and, and Johannes, which didn't talk about the three types per se, but talked about the mode of invasion of gas into, into the sediment. And basically, the type two gas is basically the invasion is going in between the grains and into the capillary, the, into, into the, the, the pores, while the invasion in, in that is structure opening that happens in clay actually displaces the sediment itself. And this is the model I like best. And now we see that there is, it's a whole continuum. It's not just two modes. It's a whole continuum of things. And what we're seeing is that we have two different modes in this continuum that we can observe in our gas in the, in the offshore of Haifa. Now, this is a section crossing the outer, or the middle to outer shelf of the Haifa Bay. Yes, and you're seeing here the Kokal ridges of uh, Alonaga, uh, Alonaga Lil. And you're seeing the Kokal layer, and you, you need to believe me because this, this interpretation goes not just on this display of the data, but on different displays on the different lines. I show this display because this display in envelope enhances very nicely the reflectivity of the gas. So we have top core car. And top core car I define as the as this this unconformity, this this erosive surface that we all know, that we all know from the from land and that we all know from the seismic sections that we worked with in the in the continental shelf. And above that surface what we have is this layering of clay silt, clay silt, clay or clay silty sediments, which is what we looked at before. Basically, this, we believe, is the surface, the, the erosive surface of the LGM, and since then, it's the filling, the, the holocenic filling of marine sediments into this basin, okay? And when, and, and when I go and, and look at this, what I see is that there is a front of gas that is going across the entire area, but unlike the picture of Lee, notice, there is here, we are at 40, 50 milliseconds, that is 35 meters depth. And here we are at about 80 milliseconds, which is about a 65, 60 meters depth. So almost double the depth, yes? And yet, the distance between the gas and the seafloor is basically constant. You see, there is a gas front, which is Basically, not, look at, not, not at all dependent on the depth. Moreover, you can see it very nicely here. You see the different layers? And the layers just continue into the gas. Here, there, there. The gas is not being held by any specific layer. This is a concept that was wrongly inserted into our minds. It has nothing to do with reality. Here you see it very clearly. You see how it crosses the different layers. Okay? So it's not a liturgical control. There is a gas front that is held basically in a constant uh, space from the seafloor or constant distance from the seafloor. And when I map it over the entire area, it looks like there is a bowl of the surface A of top cooker, and within it there is a bubble. Or a, or a front of gas that resides within it. And soon I will look into more details. This green line, I said, okay, maybe there is a source layer, yes? And all this front is basically that's coming out of a source layer. So what I did is I took a surface that basically is a almost parallel, basically parallel to this gas front, 
and drew it on the data to try and see if I see any layer that is conformal with this. And I know that this, in this figure it's not very clear, but no, I haven't found any such layer. You can go through uh, always uh, filling up the shelf paper and you will not see a layer that is consistent with the gas layer above. It does not fit uh, an idea of a, of a equidistance from a source. The, the layers have their own thing, they do their own thing. They basically fill the shelf based on the sea level, and so you will get them going up like this and not parallel to this. There is another strange thing that I found. Notice, when we get close to the cool car, suddenly the gas reflectivity is stopped. Yes, you see, it stopped for no reason at all. Now, we only have six meters of gas, but, and, and, but it stops about, a, about 15 milliseconds when the gas arrives about 15 milliseconds above the core car. Look, on both sides, pretty much the same. Now, this is interesting because they don't touch each other. It's like it knows that it's below, it stops. And that's, that's a weird thing that <coughs> took me a very long time to... And actually, Gilad Antler eventually came up with an, an idea that might solve this question. So, this is one section. Let's look at all the data that we recorded from the entire Haifa Bay. And this takes the, the surveys up to 2012. And now, with 2013, there is a complementary complementation here, and I will show you. And what I did here is I, I, I drew where, where you see the lines. The lines are our seismic surveys. And, and there is a confusion here between the seismic surveys and the contours. I apologize. But you can see which are seismic uh, surveys. And on the seismic survey, whenever there was, what I did is I simply picked the top of gas, free-handedly. You can, you can find me making mistakes here and there, but generally, I picked it, and then I basically mapped it. I just plotted the values of those peaks after a, subtracting the distance between the seafloor and the peak. So this is the depth below the seafloor of those peaks. And what you see is an interesting phenomenon. Generally, we are residing 16, 15 milliseconds below the seafloor. This is the greenish uh, stuff between 12 and 16. That is about 10 meters below the surface, more or less. And you can see that pretty much this is what you get throughout, OK? Except for the edges. And what happens at the edges, there is this orange belt. You notice that there is orange values all around, and I can tell you that now we have completed it all the way around. Basically, before stopping, the gas goes up a little bit shallower. Let's look up a, a moment. You see this? Partly, this is not just here. It happens everywhere. Before it stops, it goes up a little bit. So there is another transmission between between this and the there is another another issue. So we have this this belt. Now there is these there are these uh, values here which I now know that are erroneous. So let's scrap this. There is a sandy area, and I was confusing between sandy uh, seafloor and the presence of of gas. And I'll show you the example. And there is a very anomalous area over here which we will look at in detail. But basically we see the gas is constant distance from the seafloor. And constant distance from the seafloor brings us back to this. Because what does it mean? What controls the place of the gas? It's not lithology. Yes, it's not pressure. It's the presence of oxygen or sulfate. Yes, it's what seawater brings in, right? That's the control. So that, that, is, that is what we're seeing here, is what we see in our observation, that in first order, this process is what is controlling the gas. 
nothing else. Okay? Now let's go complicate ourselves a little bit. What you see here are some examples uh, of, of sections going across <coughs> across the area. This is the south south section, uh, and this is the east west section. No, this is the this is. Hmm, I need to fix it because they are both sort of. No, it's okay. This this is this, and this is, is that. Okay, and what you're seeing is something strange that there is different ways in which the in which the gas follows or keeps the the, the parallelism with the seafloor where the reflect the, the layers are not so parallel to the seafloor we see very scattered reflectivity where the layers are sub parallel to the seafloor we see that they actually that the gas actually converges into those layers you see it another nice thing is those steps you see how the seafloor is going like that, but the gas is actually going in steps. And in, uh, at the top of every step is a reflective layer. So basically, yes, at the second order, the gas does prefer to be inside the porous layers. Or the porous layers allow it to go further out towards the seafloor. And when there is a porous layer that matches the, the balance, the oxidation reduction balance, the gas will be taking it. But overall, it will keep that trend of being subparallel to seafloor. Okay? So that's a, that's a second order phenomenon. And so we see here again the mixed mode between reservoir type or reservoir type penetration of gas and, uh, and, and fracture type bubbles working here. See, when, when, where it doesn't fit it, it has to, more bubbles are being created and the, the, it works more in bubbles. And when, the, when it fits it it, 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 it resides more in a layer and doesn't bother producing bubbles. <coughs> or differently said, here there is no potential, there is no, nothing that drives it, there is no pressure to create the bubbles and break the way through. Here, in, it, it, it has the pressure to break the way through. The bubbles are bigger, they grow, and they want to break out. And they keep breaking out, okay? So it's all about physical potential. So this reminds us of the Lee model, and now we have something that can explain the Lee model. Something that there is a pressure difference, and yes, the gas, if it has a, an advantage, will go sideways along beneficial pathways. Now comes the more, the stranger thing. What I show you here in color is the map of the top cooker layer or top cooker horizon. Again, top cooker is top cooker unit. It's not all cooker. It's whatever that there is there. That's this erosional surface. Yeah. And you see the, the contours are the depths of, of the top cooker with respect to the seafloor. Yes? And what you see is that the coca makes sort of a bowl here. There is sort of a valley. And the colors are again the peaks of the gas, but this time it's the distance between gas peaks to the coca and not to the seafloor. Okay? And what you see is first of all that the gas is nicely constrained at a at about 25 milliseconds of depth of cool car. You see, it's this, this beige color, which all the gas is constrained within this beige color. You don't see gas over the red one, but you definitely see gas over deeper stuff. So the bowl, the, the, the depth of the bowl is constraining the gas. The cool car is somehow inhibiting the distribution of the gas being significantly below it because the values that we have here is what you see is that the gas just get closer 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 to the coca and notice here it's just continuously we go from purple to yellow to blue and that blue around 15 milliseconds or around 10 meters is where it stops 
Yeah? So 10 meters away from the Kuka, it simply stops. All around the entire, and, and, and irregularities we saw before are now less, less pronounced. So here, here you saw all these irregularities that we see all around. Suddenly the edge is clean. Yes, the edge of the gas is very clean. So what inhibits the distribution of the gas is the presence of the kuka a distance away from it. Not the way that the fact that it touches the kuka, neither that it comes from the kuka. In fact, uh, I think Weaver, I've noticed it in the Baltic, in the Baltic Sea, and what he suggested is that basically the gas stops where the, the base of the gas layer is touching the kuka. But what we saw is that the base of the gas layer is a few meters above the coca and it's not touching the coca yet it stops. And, and you can see it very nicely here. You see this is a section going over here at the edge of the shelf and you see the coca and you see it comes to a depth that is big enough, oh, it appears, it goes up again, oh, it disappears. The gas is here, only here. More interestingly, and here I know that the figure is not amazing, we should find a way of doing a better figure. What we have found in this area, uh, which is here, what we have found is that there are different blocks beneath the sediments. Those are definitely, those are basically blocks of coal car, yes, units that are beneath the sediments. And what you see is when those isolated blocks are, are appearing, and, and I know again, it's, you, you have to, to believe me, I need to make a better figure. What you see is that every time you get something like this, oh, the gas comes up. You see this? The gas comes up. You see this? The gas comes up. Suddenly the gas goes shallower when you have these irregularities at the seafloor. So when there is a big cocoa body, it just disappears. When there is a small cooker body at the bottom, it jumps up. Now, a word about those things. I try to investigate what are those blocks. And uh, you see here, uh, again, I did, the, it's the same area. What I did is again this trick of processing. I processed, processed it so that I mix and so enhance the coherent uh, reflectivity. And what I found, are those coca blocks like this and that. And I see that beneath this, there are continuous reflections. Even look at this big coca block, which is this thing. You can see that beneath it, you can see the reflectivity going straight through. So there are regular layers beneath, and then there are blocks of coca on top, or whatever. I call it coca, but there are blocks on top. And, and those blocks are just laid on top of something else. I will suggest, in analogy to what we see at the coast, that these will be a clay, possibly terrestrial clay layers, yes? And those cars are just fossilized dunes or whatever that have been eroded or partly eroded. And this is what we see here. And I'm not the first one that suggested it. In fact, I go after great ones. I go after need, which mark those things and call them cal calcarenite. He said that those were calcarenite bodies and said that beneath there are clays. So here I go right after him and he was, a, he was doing his work supported by, by drillings and by, by sampling. So this is the model we have. Something that is clay, and I would say organic rich, and I would say possibly the source from which I get the organic material to create the methane, and then the blocks, which are porous calcarenites. We know them. We know what cocar is in its different forms. It's a very porous thing. And so when I have a porous body on the sea floor, I suddenly see jump up of the gas and they are far away from each other. Again, they don't touch each other. The gas is not touching the coca, it's above it. And yet it jumps up. This brings me to, uh, this is suggestive in my mind. Oh, 
let's let's look at it a little bit in, in, in a little bit of detail. What you see here, the shading behind is again the depth of the core car layer or the top core car. And what you see are those blocks. You see them as bright ones. Deeper is dark, shallower is white, and you see those blocks. And what you see is the depth of the gas with respect to the seafloor. Okay? And you see that the gas jumps shallower every time it gets near to those blocks. Very nicely. But when it gets near to a, a, to a big coca body, it simply stops. It goes up and stops. Okay? To me, the fact that I'm transmitting information meters below to meet the, to the gas meters above means that I need to have a flow because that's the only way I can get information from the core car up. Now a flow, if I have a flow, fluid flow, yes, and we don't know what the fluid is yet. Is there yet? If I have a fluid flow, then of course if there is a core car block at the bottom, that is a pathway for the fluid to be faster. And so if I have higher fluid flow, if there is a facilitator, then there will be higher fluid flow above these and lower fluid flow away from them. And that is, in, in my mind, an explanation that is good with this. We're still left with the problem of the bigger coca blocks. Why does it stop? And here, Gilad Adler brought me the idea. He said, you know what? They are exposed to the seawater. So maybe what happens is that we get seawater into those bigger coca bodies and we don't get seawater into those. Those are isolated, we don't get seawater there. Here we get seawater and if we have seawater, then there will be a possibility for sulfate to come in, in through the coca and then either be advected or diffused towards the, towards the, the gas areas and the sulfate there would inhibit the creation of methane, right? We know. So basically, about, around what we would predict is that around the, cool, the, cool, the big coca bodies, there is a halo of sulfate or something of the sort, yes? And that would inhibit the gas from existing near them, and they would only exist away from those bodies. And this actually, this idea of, of, of the system of the gas coming up and down as a response to advection was uh, raised by Regnier et al. Again, looking at the, I think it, it was looking at the Baltic Sea, at some, at some areas of the Baltic Sea where they have bottom springs or, or freshwater springs. And, and he found that when there is fluid advection, the gas layer goes up. And when there isn't, the gas layer is deeper and gets more space to develop. OK, so that's another story. Now, 2013 added a new aspect. For the first time, we saw what is happening at the edge of the shelf. And what is happening at the edge of the shelf is those sedimentary layers are dropping out and they are forming dipping reflections out to the outer shelf. And we get the same behavior of the shallow gas. This is the cool car and the shallow gas. But suddenly, we get those things. Yes, which are shallow, very shallow, tens of centimeters, a shallow things. And at the beginning, when I saw this, I didn't believe they were gas. Yes, until we sampled them. And here I must go to the last part of the talk I see, and that is the sampling. As part of the of a, an ongoing search, Barak and Dorit and I sort of hooked together and once I took them to Palmachim and uh, instead of finding gas we found coca and since then Barak is laughing at me that whenever I come to the boat we don't find gas we find coca whenever the coal will fall we find coca but they believed me at me again and they believed in the story and we went out and we started sampling uh, and just to remind you what it should look like this is the concentration of sulfate that is declining, the, con the, the concentration of methane that is going up, and, this, and the sulfate methane transition zone, this we looked at, that's in general what we should find. Yes, and this is 
But there is also a signal in the isotopic composition of the of the carbon in which we see that the the delta C13 of the methane should, should be at the minimum at the uh, at the transition zone and the dissolved inorganic carbon delta C13 should be at a minimum just above it. And that is describing an in situ producing that is methanotrophy, methano, uh, sorry, methano, uh, Genesis. methanogenesis and methanotrophy right above each other. This is what they are describing here, just for you to remember. The first attempts were actually earlier. A few years ago, we saw this thing. It's, it's uh, shown by uh, Uri. We were all very excited. I remember we all parted. We said, here it is, an active seepage. Yes? Following that, Orit came, and that was the first meeting with Orit, and she sampled the same place with two cores, HU and P130, about 100 meters apart. And notice that the distinct is, a, is more than, is, is about 100 meters itself. And especially the P130 is right here, yes? And you can see here that there is seafloor, cool car, so in my model, there wouldn't be gas here at all, so we wouldn't understand that. And here are the gas reflectivities that I showed you before at the edge of the cool car. And this is from a Gilad's paper in 2013. He compared what he found in those cores to what he found in the Arcon. In the Arcon, he found that the sulfate is finishing at 30 centimeters. This is a methanogenic system. You could find the sulfate finishing at 30 centimeters. When they went to P130 and to HU consistently at the depth of 200, uh, uh, at, at the depth of two and a half meters, we still have sulfate, we still have half the concentration of sulfate. So it's not, definitely not as methanogenic as they, as they are called. Okay, not very much in agreement with having an active seepage at the seafloor. We tried a few more sites, and what you're seeing here is a paper that was just accepted and will soon be out. We, we went for several sites, uh, those are the AGU P130, and those sites were chosen based on the reflectivity, and you can see, we tried three sites, conceptually. One that we saw, one of those higher gas reflectivity patches, and, and then you're seeing the core, and now this is a five and a half meter core, a, at scale to the seismic section. So here we sampled above, a few meters above the thing. Then we went to the edge of the shelf and we sampled one of those things. I was completely unclear that what, what we will find there, but we said, let's try. And then we went to a place where I didn't see any reflectivity. Well, SG1, the one with the reflectivity going to 40 centimeters, Look at the concentration of sulfate. It went down in, in about half a meter to zero and about a, a 40 micromole, basically saturation at the same depth of methane. And in fact, yeah, I will finish this and I will finish the talk. A, and in fact, the core was completely <coughs> disturbed with, by bubbles. But basically, we sampled at 40 centimeters bubbles of methane. Yes, and this is the, if anybody went to the talk of uh, Michal in the, in the conference, we found, she showed a new sampling that they did where they see something like hybrids coming out over there. I don't know. Anyway, P3, PC3 is the, the rest of the sampling sites, including Natania, what we found is that the sulfate went down at two, two and a half meters, went down to zero, and we started finding trace methane. Notice the difference in scale of the methane concentration between this and that, yes? It's a hundred times difference, yeah? <clears throat> so we found trace methane. Unfortunately to me, we, we also find it in the NRD where I predicted no uh, methane. My explanation, remember we're seeing the dissolved 
Then here we see the dissolved methane, except for here, which you could see the methane coming out. You smell the, it, it was all, all over the place, yes? But uh, you smell the, the sulfides. But in these places, we are probably sampling the dissolved methane, which ex extends way outside of the, of the saturation zone. But definitely, here and here and in the other corals, we found that there is the finishing of sulfate and appearance of methane a few meters above the reflectivity of the gas. Yes, and uh, looking at the, I won't go into it, looking at the uh, isotopic composition, they suggest, the Beersheva group and, and, and Barak suggest, that the production, the methanogenesis is in situ. That is, we're not bringing the methane from down, we're creating it in place. So now, this is where we are, trying to understand how the advection from below fits with those observations. And here, I think I should stop. We'll not get to Ziv's uh, work. Thank you. Simona Afnein Katam, have a course from the hyperbase, uh, hyperbase Why are you not incorporating here information about the stratigraphy? But maybe I lost it in the first slides because I was not here. No, it's just a. Uh, and it's just the, the magnitude. Well, the also, point is... She also, also marks uh, uh, wetland units, which you really yes. want for, for your... What is the plan. deepest water depth that she is sampling? She's go I, I don't remember, but she's going hundreds of meters. Hundreds of meters from the shore? Ah, no. Kilo kilo sure. Kilometers from the shore? And she, the, the, I, I the thought shore that her cores were all from the shallow water. Maybe I should no, recheck. No, no, no. You're saying that there is new stuff. No, not new stuff. She, she published it in the last three years. What I, I understood that all this drilling was done inside the bay, not outside the bay. What we're talking here is the okay. outer shelf. Yeah. I should yeah. go to Simona yeah. and recheck it. I, yeah, I, I agree think, with you. I think uh, she, has, she has at least one call from, from the outer shelf. But Notice one, one thing. I didn't not mention it, but basically the gas, this is the 40 meters depth. This is the 30 meters depth contours. The gas basically appears at 30, 35 meters water, and that's consistent with Natania as well. We don't see the gas any shallower except for the estuaries. And she has, she has course like, almost at the edge of the continental shelf. I go to Simon. That's a good thing to and do. And another thing is that uh, uh, it's I thought that it was all shallow. That's why I didn't no, go. No, no, no. And okay, another thing is that um, uh, from Merab's master thesis, uh, it's clear that the sedimentological uh, zonation that uh, we always see parallel to the uh, shoreline of, of sand, uh, silt, and clay in the Haifa Bay is different, and you have like a um, a uh, sink for coarse sediments where you have your your uh, purple um, here. This is, this is, the, there is a, there is actually a reef. No, 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 no. In, the, in the more, well, I need to show you the maps, but maybe. You, we should talk, yeah, we should talk. The thing is that it's coarse with sediments, and uh, maybe it will help you understand. Better. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you again, Thank you. Thank you.